here on the Robert Elm Show on BBC London 94.9 FM. And if you have any kind of interest maybe in writing films, working on films, you have film projects you've long harboured, well, the man sitting opposite me might be one you ought to listen to a little Um, because he certainly worked on some movies. He's worked on just for a few of them, the rest of the Black Swan, the Fight Club, the Lion King, the Thin Red Line. He's Chris Vogler and he's a story consultant. He's going to be giving some talks about what he does, but we thought we'd get him in here now to talk to all of us. Chris, welcome to BBC London. Very glad to be here. First of all, let's let's pin down what a story consultant does. What, what's your role on a movie, would you say? Well, you know, often it's uh, uh, last-minute triage. As the thing is about to go down in flames, they'll, they'll call <laughs> the fire department in to put out the fire. But So you're the red adair. Of- <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. sometimes I will uh, light a big explosion and, and blow the whole thing up just before it hits production. But... Uh, Basically, my role is to read the script and and respond to it uh, as a, an expert in story and and try to help them bring out their intention because sometimes the writers get blinded by the complexity of it and uh, they get lost in there and sometimes it's good to bring in an outsider late in the process to review and see well okay we know something's not working how can we uh, how can we diagnose that and prescribe a solution so are you a script doctor is that another name for what you know that's actually a different uh, look out that uh, in, involves actually writing something uh, what I write is notes I write uh, uh, you know a three or four or five page set of notes uh, in which I kind of give my philosophy and try to get them on a different track but a, a, a true script doctor will actually re- rewrite the script so yours is much more about the broader arc, perhaps, or the story, or the characters, or... Yes, yes. I'm looking at mostly the structure, about how can we uh, line up the events in the story so that it will produce the maximum emotional impact at the end of the film. Uh, and uh, often I'm working between the producers of the studio and the writers as a, a kind of an ambassador between them uh, to, to, to get the... To make everybody happy, you know. So how did you end up doing what you do? What was your background? Well, I started out in journalism. I'm from the Midwest. I was a farm boy from Missouri with no uh, film connections whatsoever, no uncle in the business. But uh, my lucky break was I joined the Air Force out of school, and I was sent to Los Angeles uh, to make documentary films. And so that th- thrust me uh, out there. I don't It's think, a movie land. Yes. I, I don't think I would have had the guts to go there on my own from St. Louis, Missouri. Missouri, uh, but the, the military flung me there, and then after that, I went to the film school at USC, and that sort of opened the door. So did you want to write originally, or direct, or act? What was your kind of... Yeah, the thing was, uh, you know, everyone wanted to direct, and but at, at the time I came along, people were becoming aware there's an avenue of writing, and uh, screenwriting was, was becoming... Uh, something that you could actually teach. Uh, there were a few books starting to come out. Uh, mine was among them, but uh, uh, th- th- that was only then beginning, this is in the mid-70s, only then beginning to be uh, a recognized uh, uh, avenue to get into the business. Is there a formula that, that kind of fits, that you can apply, you know, like a kind of template you can stick over the top of a script? And well, say- the formula is kind of a dirty word to me. Uh, I think of it as anything but that. But what I have done is reduced the elements of story to about 12 movements, like in a symphony or something, that uh, pretty much need to be there. If you don't have these things, you, you don't really have a story. Uh, my... Uh, way of looking at it comes out of mythology. So I'm looking at the ancient patterns and I've extracted out of them a little template that seems to apply and, and help people. So does that mean though that if someone comes on with a radical new way of telling a tale or whatever or some exciting new talent, you're going to go, nah, no, it doesn't fit the template. It's not quite right. Actually, I'm, I'm more generous than that and can find, <laughs> I can, I can find uh, uh, these elements in almost anything. I, I mean, I love dealing with filmmakers, especially from Eastern Europe. It seems that they have a violent opposition to <laughs> any kind of structure, maybe because they, they're, they're glad to have thrown off the Soviet yoke. But uh, I have fun with them. Uh, uh, pointing out that uh, while you have run far in the other direction of structure and, and order, uh, it's still there. You know, you can't escape it. Really. So if you take some of the kind of great maverick American filmmakers, I don't know, supposing we were to look at Peckinpah or we were to sure. look at Scorsese in his earlier years or whatever, would they fit your 
your pattern, even though they were considered kind of radical at the time? Yes, I've spent a lot of time analyzing those because people will bring me these, you know, uh, maverick examples. Yeah. And uh, I don't have any trouble usually finding this inner structure, which I, I think you can't escape it because it's hardwired into the human nervous system. And what I found, I was one of those filmmakers, too, as a student filmmaker. Sure. I was, you know, Mr. Outrage. I wanted to do everything backwards and upside down. And then when it was evaluated by the audience, they put it back into the old fashioned frame again. Uh, people can't perceive things uh, without these certain uh, touch points, you know, that, that just it's what defines a story for people. And if you try to fight it, they're going to fight you back and, and cram it back towards uh, the conventional story pattern. So if people were to come along to, to one of your, I don't know, what should we call them, kind of lectures or classes or... we call them workshops workshops that's a good word <laughs> workshop is a good word because uh, they're going to be doing the work then that's, that's right <laughs> <laughs> um, what sort of st- what sort of wisdom can you impart to them well i i first of all i'm very positive and i try to, to tell people that uh you know you must redefine your idea of success for one thing and uh realize that getting it made getting it uh, uh, uh the academy awards or a bafta and so forth all that stuff is great but there's a huge satisfaction in just getting the story off your chest and if you've expressed something and a few people read that you might have changed their lives and that's huge so uh if it if it doesn't get uh, an agent for you uh, don't feel crushed because you've you've done something if you've written something from your heart because it's an intrinsically tough business i mean that's one of the things that people have to remember isn't it that it that even if you know even if your script is really good even if the idea is novel all those sort of things chances are it still won't get me. Well, I used to be jealous of the screenwriters because they made, you know, millions of dollars. But as I got closer to it, I began to realize there's a reason. And, uh, it, you know, they, they may be underpaid because of all the torment they have to go through. Are they valued in Hollywood these days? Because there certainly was a time that they were, they, they, well, they certainly thought of themselves as undervalued compared to directors and actors and all of that. Well, sure, that was always the, uh, the, uh, the, the grief that they would express was uh, that we're, you know, as the executives put it, schmucks with with Underwoods <laughs> back in the old days. But um, actually, they have been devalued, literally, in the sense that their salaries have dropped. Everyone has had to take a, a haircut. They've had to go back by 50%. There used to be an independent price, which was cheaper, and then there would be the studio price, which was very nice. And now there's only one price, the independent price. So. Are the studios... Is Hollywood struggling? Is that the right word to say, do you think? That's exactly the right word, yes. Uh, They're in holy terror because they just don't know what's happening. It's shifting right under their feet, and they know it's getting smaller, and they know that, you know, each generation goes to the movies a lot in their youth, and then it tapers off. And this generation is starting out tapered off. So they aren't uh, coming to the traditional pattern of, of going to the movies in quite the same way. And so the studios don't know what to do with that. Perhaps that pattern exists. Though. I mean, I would say as a man in his 50s who, who loved going to the movies and does go much less regularly than I once did, I think it's because no one's making films for me. I think it's because they're all making films trying to chase my 17-year-old son rather than me. And I've got more money than him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of... Yeah, I, I make that speech quite often to the studios. <laughs> is that really? I, Yeah, I'm in that demographic as well. I'm in my 60s now. And uh, I, uh, you know, look back at it and, and, and say, gee, I wish you'd make some movies for me because I'd turn out for sure. But uh, they, they, they don't think so. And, and really? So, is that... Yeah. I mean, so are you kind of railing against the wind there is no one listening to that uh to some extent that's true yeah yeah i i i i I go ahead and say it anyway though because uh i I have to is it tougher now to get a movie made than it ever was or is is there's a lot of movies being made isn't there yeah there's quite a a a a glut of movies actually uh and a lot of independent films a lot of kind of much smaller budget films etc yeah it's very tough even to get your movie uh seen in a festival is extremely difficult now i found that out i had an independent film i worked on some years ago and uh, we just couldn't get it in, into the festivals because uh, that, that's just fiercely, fiercely competitive. But on the other hand, there are all these other new ways of uh, bringing entertainment. A lot of it's very fragmented uh, because of the and nature. And no one can of work out how to get the money out of that's it. That's right, and, th- and that's the big thing: is how do you how do you turn a buck out of it? But it's it's still. Uh, Something that people are drawn to this for some reason. There's a desire to be part of it. Uh, that's what got me there in the first place, was, was being so hypnotized by the movies and television and saying, you know, I, I don't care. I want to be in this. Do you pick 
films that you kind of put up to your to your workshoppers as kind of great examples? Or yes, I'm sort of a classicist. I mean, my whole thing is based in mythology, so I'm always looking backwards at uh, the patterns from the past, and I feel that the best movies have already been made. Uh, the, uh, certainly there are fine films yet coming out. But uh, a lot of the good ones already got made, and and those are templates. Uh, and some people reject that, you know, as a formula too. But uh, certain films. So come on, give it, give us, give us some of the well, great ones. You know, it sounds weird, but a, a couple of very pop films, uh, like An Officer and a Gentleman, is one that uh, became a template. Uh, the Wizard of Oz uh, has generated many, many other stories like it. Certain uh, John Ford westerns, uh, The Searchers is one that people go back to. Uh, I was talking with uh, the filmmaker Darren Aronofsky recently yep. about a project he's on now, and that was my main contribution. Where they said, Darren, look at The Searchers, and he said, Oh yeah, once he'd seen it, that's uh, that's the pattern, and uh, and so he found a lot of value in looking backwards. Is it fair to say, and I've had this, I mean, we have a, a, a film critic who comes in every week, Jason Solomon, who's a very respected film critic here, and him and I have the conversation a lot, that one of the things that it seems Hollywood isn't doing is producing stars in the way that it once did. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a time that I would go and see every film that, that I don't know, a young De Niro was in, or Brando for the generation before me, or, you know, whatever it was, and pick, pick your star. Those big, larger-than-life, often male characters, men, usually not boys, don't, where are they gone? There's George Clooney. Are there many others? I mean, has Hollywood kind of rejected, which was always the home of stars, seemed to have turned its back on them a little bit? Yeah, I think the machinery for all of that has been weakened by the nature of the Internet, which is so participatory and so much uh, yeah. encourages the feeling that you are creating it. And that's how it should be. Uh, and I think the studios are maybe behind the curve a little bit. Uh, in in still trying to impose a star on somebody, uh, I, another thing that's gone on that I've observed is is that uh, anybody who had their feet as a, as a, in their career back in the 20th century is having a really hard time looking at someone like Eddie Murphy. The bulk sure. of his career was in the in the past century, and uh, after uh, 10, 12 years. Uh, that's over the horizon, and it's very wow. difficult for those people to reinvent themselves. If that's over the horizon, I mean, I'm still a John Wayne I fan. Know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Yeah, some of those silent movies were pretty good. You know? <laughs> well, we had a pretty good silent movie they said this year, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. That was good. Yeah. But did you like that? I did. Did you think it worked well? Did I it, did. Did it fit your template? It, it fit fairly well, yes. Uh, I thought, you know, compared to the films of the past, it was uh, what what you say, a little soft or a little weak. But, I thought it uh, was a little, yeah. For yeah. me, it was. It, it didn't have any spine, I thought. Yeah, it had, it had all of the, uh, the glitter and the production values and all that was the best you could hope for. And we loved it in L.A. because they actually shot it in L.A. and they went out and did archaeology to go and find the actual streets that looked the, as they as they did back then and they still do uh, but it was a sort of a, an, an, an empty Easter egg you know there was not much content in there when it really came down to it Sin as you're here in London what, what, what do you think about British movie making over the years of don't pull that face. No, that they, <laughs> no, that's that's uh, preparatory to, to get enthusiastic. That was, that was my screwing up to get enthusiastic face. No, I'm I'm a big fan, and uh, I like. I, I'm sorry about the. Uh, the, the economic situation and the, 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 the thing that's happened with the, 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 the film funds drying up, yeah. you know, that, that was kind of tragic because they produced a lot of movies that wouldn't get made otherwise. And sometimes those were, uh, were, were films that I particularly enjoyed. Uh, there was uh, one recently uh, about the Roman legions in, uh, in the, the north of Britain. I've forgotten the title now. The legion, it might have been called. But... Uh, that would have been made without the film fund money. So, uh, so th that's that's too bad. Um, tell us how people can come and, and get involved in a workshop and stuff. Well, we have a few seats left. Uh, I'm gratified to say we're almost sold out. But it's uh, raindance dot org is my sponsor and the uh, phone number there if you want to check it's it out. Co dot uk, I think. That's here. W oh, yeah. I've got www.raindance.co.uk, or have you got .org? It's .org. It's oh, okay. There may be, Sorry you, about that. You can probably get there both ways. But the phone number anyway is 0207-287-3833. So I'll do that one more time. 0207-287-3833. Yes. Apparently the .org and the .co.uk both work. I think so. So you can go through either of those. Um, and you could spend some days, spend some time... When is it? When are the, the classes? Oh, there's the, two, uh, isn't it? Uh, Saturday and Sunday. 
this Saturday and Sunday mm -hmm. in the company of Chris Vogler, story consultant. Chris, thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir.